Hey guys, how are you doing? Today I'm going to review yet another blog, this time by a guy called Guy Galon. He wrote a really cool blog. I just wanted to share it with you because I get so many questions about how to deal with risks and risk playbooks. And this blog, which was published on LinkedIn, you can find it at Customer Success Proactive Prediction Guy Galon. And by the way, Guy is a customer success executive. And so he has a lot of experience. This was written by 2019. And I happened to stumble upon it because Anita, the chief churn crusher, found it and she posted about it three days ago. And I was like, I got to read what she's talking about. So I want to read this with you and kind of give you a quick review of what I'm seeing here. So basically his approach is around how do we reduce the unknown risks for dealing with customers while maximizing opportunities for success? And he goes through this blog about a few examples and situations that typically happen and how should we in customer success approach that? One of the situation is your customer is trailing a competitor's product or service. He's right. It's very frustrating to learn retrospectively that your customer, the one that you trusted, you thought he was loyal to you, is actually trailing your competitor's product. In fact, just the other day, I had one of my customers say, sometimes we sell a specific technology to our customers. And if they have other initiatives or products that they release that could use that same technology, yet they go to another vendor for that same data or technology to use an OEM into their products. And that's very frustrating for them as well. And in fact, they view it as a risk. Because now that customer is exposed to apples to apples, which code is better, which data is better, which platform is better for them, and they might decide to favor one versus the other. I would say if you're working with government and agencies, that's actually more often than not because they almost have to pick more than one vendor. But when it happens with non-government organization, but actually with public or private commercial companies, that should be a very red flag for you. Before we continue, don't forget, subscribe to our YouTube channel and smash that notification button so that you don't miss out on any new videos. He's not going into the typical reasons of why this happens, but he wants to focus on the few prediction tips to catch it before it happens. I love that because typically my customers are focused so much of what to do when it happened. And I always tell them, look, you have to think about how do you mitigate this risk from the get-go so that it doesn't even happen or you, or you catch it on very, very quickly. So let's see what he has to say. First of all, he approaches the customer health metrics. And he says, if you combine those with CSAT or NPS, by the way, CSAT is customer satisfaction score, typically derived from surveys that you send out after support tickets and then NPS score, is the net promoter score. It's a typical question that is embedded in customer surveys that are being sent typically once a year. Some companies send these surveys every month, every quarter. I recommend maybe twice a year is a good happy medium. But anyways, not as frequently as CSAT, not transactional surveys, but actual strategy annual surveys. And so if you combine your regular health score metrics and your CSAT and NPS, and they're always a good place to start to predict this kind of situation. So what it requires is for the CSM to proactively collect the health metrics frequently, this is the imperative word here, to accurately assess the customer's health. So basically, if you don't really update your health score on a very regular basis, it might be out of date and not reliable at all. One thing that we want to do is to be able to identify poor health before it progresses to critical state. But this is relatively easy. He's right. New questions about features and service you don't currently have in your product portfolio. So if the customer starts asking you about features or services that you don't have, maybe they have already started the conversation with other competitors. They're going to emphasize all their differentiators in that conversation, whether it's 
additional services, better services that augment their products and solutions, or literally features and modules that you don't have. So if they start asking you about this, this should be a red flag for you. So what you want to do is follow up with a question that could be about your plans to support it in the future, or you, you want to emphasize that. This is indicative of the customer's desire for the feature, potentially as a result of a demo present. Exactly what I just said. Therefore, that good understanding of your competitors' capabilities and how they are different from your product and service. This is called, by the way, creating battle cards. Your sales team might already have that or your marketing team or product marketing team might have already created that. The problem I see with most companies is that there's this big siloism and customer success is not privy to sales enablement tools and documents. Ask your sales team for their battle cards and then take the initiative to have once a month, once every couple of weeks, do a lunch and learn with your customer success team to go through these battle cards. So important to understand who are our competitors, what are their differentiators? So when they do get these questions asked by their customers, they don't think it's just by any chance, but they can quickly detect and guess which competitors they're actually talking to. If you liked what you've heard so far, that's awesome. More coming in a second here, but in the meantime, I want you to click that like button so that YouTube knows that this is great content and you can start sharing it with others. Pay attention to timing and context. And if the customer starts asking questions that have never been asked before, then you have an early sign to watch for. How many of you have that in your health score or risk indicator? I bet zero, very, very few do. I certainly haven't seen that. So good job, guy. Another potential signal is when your customer who was previously engaged is unresponsive for a long time. And so the concerning duration is very much dependent on the typical usage of your product and services. What does that mean? If you sell a budgetary system where they mainly use it once a year and maybe once a quarter and they're not engaged every day, that's okay. But if it's something like an HR system that logs daily hours of employees, then of course they should be engaged a lot in your system and possibly with support tickets, et cetera. You have to gauge for that. Like, is this really an issue or not? So if the product is supposed to be used every day and they haven't been engaged for a number of weeks, that's a big red flag. If it's just once a year, I don't know how this is going to help you. Okay. So then the next question is, what do I do now that I found out about it? It's a really good question. Your sales team surely needs to be involved in the planning and preparation for an improvement plan. First of all, I think the CSM should triage the situation and see if there's really merit in it. If you can validate that they have actually talking to a competitor or they have won, maybe there's an RFP out for another project. So think about it kind of like cross-selling. You do need to re-engage for this new use case they're trying to do and resell them for that use case. If your CSM team has a lot of sales experience, they might not need the sales team, but it really depends on your specific business structure. If your sales team is more well-equipped, has more resources, yeah, I think collaboration is right on the money. Then there's other situation like your customer's internal politics are interfering with your renewals and it goes into the same thing. And then your main stakeholder and champion is about to leave. Ooh, so some good suggestions here. So for example, what would be indicators that they might be leaving? First of all, a new person is being copied on emails and communications between you and your primary stakeholder. If we revisited the internal politics case, your stakeholder failed to get an internal promotion or additional responsibility. Oh my gosh. They might leave and then they have to bring a new one. Like management is already contemplating on bringing someone on top to have this guy report to. Sometimes their stakeholders manager will join the calls and meetings and will be a silent listener. This is when he's building the case to let that person go. I hope this is not completely stressing out everyone about their job. There are cases where your stakeholders level of engagement somehow slows down versus his or her previous yeah, you know, 50-50, they may, might have some other things going on. How can you get more insights on your stakeholders next move if you actually think that they're moving, especially if there's like multiple of these signs going on at the same time? So you might want to ask yourself a few questions. If a QBR is coming shortly, 
ask whether there are any additional topics to be covered. I wouldn't ask that in a QBR. I don't think that they're going to tell us that if you're going to find out beforehand, you're probably going to find it out in one-on-one -on -one conversation. I would say schedule a call with our manager, schedule a call with our peers and kind of fish around. If the renewal is in two, three months, ooh, that's stressful. I would ask the stakeholders about their plans for renewal. I think that's a good idea anyways, to ask everybody if they could renew early, would they? And what is their sentiment about renewals? Are they going to renew with the same budget, a higher budget, a lower budget? You kind of want to ask that 180 days before or sooner. Again, assuming good relationship is in place, find out more about their personal plans of the stakeholders you're engaged with. And if none of the above is due, you can suggest a demo of new product feature. Why? This feature should be interesting and valid. I don't think so. I think that you should offer to have like a workshop or a session to show them what other companies in their industry that are your customers are doing with your solution. So shift the conversation from features and functions to use cases and outcomes. I think you're going to get a lot better engagement from your customers because everybody owns a certain performance level to their management and they don't own oh, let me see this cool widget. That's why maybe TV shows like Inspector Gadget and movies like 707 are so popular because some people really like gadgets. But I would say in general, pitching a new use case or methodology or benchmarking them against other customers in their own industry is probably more interesting. Again, assuming a good relationship, they might decide to add more people and then you can generally inquire. All right, so I would say read the article because I kind of skipped on the second one. And I just out of time, but this is cool article. I'll include the link in the description below. Let me know if you enjoyed this video, smash the like button, subscribe to our video and click on the bell for getting notifications on new videos. Yeah. If you have more blogs, just write them in the comments below and I'll see you at the next video.